with the staff members. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to point out the toilet facilities in the business. They are not or in the business school. They're not the easiest to find. So the ladies' toilets is just to the left of the stairs behind the couches, and the men's toilets is just down the hall, um, past B one through two. Um, so that's all the safety announcements. So I'd like to introduce the head of women in business this year, uh, Elizabeth Boulder. Hi everyone. Thanks for coming, and apologies about the delay. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to Trinity College's fourth annual Women in Business Conference. It is truly an honour for our student body to have such an accomplished and illustrious panel at this event. We look forward to hearing each of your stories, the achievements you've accomplished and the challenges you've overcome. The, um, the overall objective of the Women in Business is to encourage female participation in the financial industry. We have, um, we have incredible sponsors, Davy, Sig, Irish Life and Elkstone. We would like to thank them for their continued support over the past few years. I would also like to thank the hard work of the Women in Business Committee and the Student Manage Fund in organising this event. <coughs> the theme of this year's conference is Becoming Agents of Change. While society has made great strides towards achieving gender balance, we also must recognise the work that has left to be done in order to achieve gender parity. We are lucky enough to be in the presence of four incredible business people, Andrew Keating, Margot Slattery, Siobhan Talbot and Sally Naipu, who can give us an insight into how change can be realised. Our, our moderator this evening is Porik Arreden. Porik is a senior corporate partner at Arthur Cox, former chairman of the DAA and current chairman of the National Lottery. Porik will introduce the panellists individually. I would now like to welcome Orla Graham, the Chief People Officer from Davy, who will speak to us briefly. Thank you and I hope you all enjoy the evening. Good evening everybody, absolutely delighted to be here at this great event. Uh, Davy have been sponsoring this event for a couple of years. Um, I'm relatively new to Davy, I was 16 years as a CHRO in Deloitte and uh, five and a half months ago I moved to Davy and um, I'd heard a lot about uh, Davy, you know, having lots of uh, males and quite a macho culture and uh, five and a half months in, I can say uh, it uh, has a lot of males, but I, the culture is very balanced. There's a big focus on developing female talent, and happy to say uh, I joined in April. Our chief financial officer uh, joined in February, and this year, six out of the eight graduates who started a couple of weeks ago are female. Um, so there's a big focus on men and women working together and having that balance. Um, also my time in Deloitte, there was a big focus on men and women working together because I think together we work better. Um, so really I'm re looking forward to hearing uh, the panellists speak today. Um, there's a huge amount of wisdom in this room and uh, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody, and you're all extremely welcome. It's wonderful to see so many people here today on this very, very bad day. Uh, I think the, the gods have been against us a little bit in terms of weather and gridlock and protests and everything else, so it's fantastic to see such a great number of people here. Um, tonight's a very important night, and it's, it's one of a succession of these nights that women in business have, has held over the last number of years. I think it's a particularly important one. Um, the, the, uh, the topic of tonight, the main theme of tonight, is how to become an agent for change. And I think certainly over the last number of years, it feels that uh, diversity and inclusion is changing in quite a material way. I think that going back a number of years, <coughs> diversity was all about structures, societal obligations, laws, regulations, uh, systems, you know, approaches within businesses. Uh, but now I think it's moving much, much more to the personal, which is, which is really important. Um, so it's, it's a way from just measurement to people taking much more individual responsibility, and men particularly taking more individual responsibility. So it goes to more to the inclusiveness part of where we're now moving, which of course is the, is the, the bed stone or bedrock of any uh, diversity, rather than sort of the, the bigger picture. And, and that means actually that all of us looking at our, our rituals, our language, our way of talking, our way of including people, in, in every way, in the way that we do business on a, on a daily basis. And I think therefore, tonight in terms of looking at the, uh, at the topic of how to be an agent of change within that structure at this particular time is an unbelievably uh, important one. 
we have an absolutely extraordinary uh, panel tonight, um, and it's something that I think that you will you will learn a lot from and you will really enjoy. Uh, I'll introduce the panel in just one minute. Um, in, in, the structure tonight is that we're going to each of the panelists is going to come up and say a few words, and then sit on the green couch um, while uh, while the, the, the first <coughs> member of the panel comes up and I'll introduce also. And so uh, of all the panel are here. We will then open the floor to uh, about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, we'll see how it's going in terms of questions and answers, and we'll get the panel all discussing things together. So I think it's better if we leave the questions to the very end so the whole of the panel can actually uh, can, can combine together in terms of answering those questions. I have very detailed intros to people, and I need to work perfect, which is, <coughs> so I'm really happy to turn off not quite. Um, so our, our panel tonight are uh, Margot Sweeney, um, Shalom Talbot, Andrew Keating, and Senator Minoko, uh, which is a terrific blend of different types of perspectives and people. Our first uh, participant tonight, our first speaker, is Margot Slattery. So um, Margot is the new Global Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the Sebexia Group, the global leader uh, in health health services that improve the quality of life. Margaret Slattery has responsibility for strategic direction, implementation and alignment of the group's integrated global diversity and inclusion initiatives. Margaret joined Sodexo in early 1990s and became country president for Ireland and Northern Ireland in 2015, before moving into her new role in September of uh, this year. Lynn Warren Margaret has won numerous awards for her role in supporting diversity and inclusion and women in business, including the Chevalier de Law for the National Day and has appeared in the Financial Times top 100 list of outstanding LGBT business leaders since 2015. Outside of Excel, she is a chair of the Outstanding Ireland Steering Committee and a member of the Irish Advisory Board for the Women's Executive Network, WXL. Her board memberships include business and the community Ireland, Irish and Equal Workplace Advocates, the Dublin Chamber of Commerce, and Southern Solid Insurance, DAC, among others. Can I welcome Margaret to the stage? Thank you so much, Maureen. Uh, that, that, that all sounds great, but you're listening to all doing the job. Thank you all very much for being here this evening. I'm delighted to get the opportunity to come and talk with you. Um, to tell you a bit about myself, um, I think when I saw with Elizabeth, you said, you know, five minutes and introduce yourself. Um, it's a long story, so it's very hard to do in five minutes, so I'll try to make it shorter. So, um, I suppose, firstly, uh, I'm, I'm just five and a half weeks in my new role, and I keep saying, well, I haven't put it in the middle yet, so I'm, I'm doing pretty really okay. Um, and I'm, I'm very lucky, I have probably the best job in the world, because I get to combine my passion and my day job, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, I would advise you all, as, as, as young people coming through the, the throes, to, to look for life, to have many changes, and there lots of different parts to it. And I've been very lucky that I'm getting I don't know, it's probably either the second part or the third, the third part of my work in life. Um, so a little bit about my background. Uh, before I said, I'm, I'm from County Limerick, and uh, I come from a farming background, and uh, a dairy farm in County Limerick. When I was a young person, my aspirations, of my, and certainly the aspirations of my parents was that I would marry someone who had a little front of it. <laughs> I'd probably be lucky enough to, uh, and, and maybe hopefully someone who's a farmer so we could keep the land, that's what it was all about, and, and increasing the yield. Um, Shimon would know all about that. Um, I, I guess I was never really going to fit into that world, and from a very young age I decided it wasn't really for me. So I rebelled, and I think that disruptive spirit has, has been there from the beginning, and uh, still remains true. Um, I, I decided to do uh, post education and how I got into that. Again, you know, everything happened sort of by chances. Um, my mom had been in hotel management, and, and I left school in the late 80s, and when I left school, um, I went to a college in Brooklyn, and they, they didn't really do much around career guidance. I think the choice that they did was doing career guidance was basketball or career guidance, so I went to basketball. Um, and when I, when I was leaving school, I was kind of going, what am I going to do? And, I did that for a while and then decided that really wasn't a long-term career for me um, and decided to come back to 
started as a traveling abroad, came back to Ireland, and came back to college and did a television management. And from that to the career I have today, it's been so totally different. I joined a company in 1991 called Ireland Merchant, who were latterly acquired by Sodexo in 2000. And um, it's probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because this large, large giant company offered me amazing opportunities. I've done probably about 30 different jobs in my career. And again, I'd leave my advice to you is to never to be, you know, it's, it's about aging to change and to never be fearful of change. And every time somebody can along with something different, I've usually said yes and then went, oh my God, okay, okay, we put any of that. <coughs> and that's where our CEO, I was actually going to leave because I was ready for change. Our CEO sort of said, well, you fancy doing this job? I said, okay. And then I thought about the fact that we had 480,000 people in 80 something countries, lots of different regions. Uh, 150 different nationalities and all the complexities of that time frame. But, you know, just like anything else, it comes together. And if you feel right and if your passion is good for it, um, that really helps. I suppose a few personal things. I'm married to Sarah, and we've been married since 2017. And uh, thanks to all of you and all the amazing people in Ireland, we get to have that right. Um, that was very important to me because I was involved in marriage equality. Um, I've been a campaigner and a disruptor in that space for a long time. Um, I was involved in the first fight that was around partnership, probably even discrimination in 1993, and then partnership, and then marriage equality in 2017. I was the chair of the we, we were the instigators of that. Um, I think that's been a phenomenal change in Ireland, and it really helped me. And one of the things I learned from it is never to be afraid to go out and make a, make a stand and do something and put yourself forward. Um, and I, initially I was really quite frightened because, you know, I was thinking about work and my future. And once I was out of work, I wasn't necessarily flying that flag in quite that way. And when I put that Sodexo were going to be uh, supporting marriage equality in Ireland and sort of a brief intervention in the back of the Summit Independent, then, you know, we're doing first few things to France. And suddenly I was in that scenario where I had to stand up and fight for what I believed in, but it wasn't a fight and I worked for a company who really believes in these things. And actually one of the most powerful things I got was that our CEO rang me soon afterwards and said, good call. And that was really empowering. So when you get to have those chances in life, it's fantastic. I suppose as I, as I bring it to a close now, I've also had the other scenario where you know, at various stages in life, I've had to fight against things and fight against discrimination and fight against, I suppose, people making judgments about you. And I think it's really important that we all continue to stand up for those. Uh, today is World Mental Health Day. Um, and, you know, if you read some of the press studies and read what's out there, see what's online, we're still facing, I think, some very tragic things. And it's very important that we all stand behind us. So I look forward to talking to you. Uh, and thank you, and uh, thank you for giving me this space, and uh, visibility is very important, and thank you for being here and uh, listening to us all. Thank you. You can see now that I meant by other the panelists tonight, and did the perspectives, and actually the culmination to change. Um, our next speaker is very much equally so, uh, Siobhan Talbot, who is the Chief Executive of uh, Gambia. Um, so as uh, Group Manager Director of Gambia, she heads up the Irish Government Nutrition Group of Operations in for the four countries. Uh, she was the second female CEO to head an Irish listed company. Prior to her appointment as Group Managing Director, she was served as Group Finance Director for her role in confidence responsibility for Group Strategic Planning. She began her career with PwC. She was the Irish Times Business Person of the Year in 2018. The Irish US Council presented she was with the award for uh, outstanding achievement in 2015 in recognition of her leadership and probably significant contribution to enhance the economic relationship between the United States and Ireland. So I'd like to introduce you to Siobhan. Thank you. Likewise, it's a real privilege to be here with you all this evening. I don't often get to talk to a group that has such fantastic general balance, so I'm delighted that you're all here and I get an opportunity to be part of it. I should say before I start, Mark, the road frontage is still really important <laughs> in Ireland, so you know, do keep that in mind. Um, so it is a delight to be here, maybe just give you a flavour of my own journey to the, at the outset. So I am a farmer's daughter, born and raised in the UK, 
Uh, educated in TIFF, and I'm only just getting over in fact, because the Kennedy Brothers are still is still very strong, and I'm black and I'm into the core when it comes to her and all of that. So I was probably very fortunate in my young years, and that I was raised by a very formidable, resilient woman who was made a widow with five kids at just the tender age of 41. Herself a teacher, losing that, and we were all very young, and she really recognised the importance of education. So it's probably difficult for many of you in the room, some way a little bit older among, among us here, to recognise that her level education was not that prevalent actually when I left school in the early 80s. But mum was a really, really believer in it. And I always remember the fact that when I was leaving school, I wasn't sure what I'd do. And I remember going for the national teaching interview and I had to sing, and I can't sing. But I met a head nun who was helping me through this great contest of singing. And at the time, I had a place to be calm in UCD. And she said to me, I met in the corridor, the leaving circle's all done, etc. She said, oh, you know, what are you doing? How's it all going? And I said, well, I have a place to be calm. And I had the interview for Pats for teaching in the morning. And she said, I hope you get a pass with no people going on. So anyway, I didn't listen, and I went to the calm. And that was great, you know, UCD was just fantastic. Obviously, being a young lass from South Kenya was a fantastic experience. But equally, when I was in UCD, I didn't know what I was going to do next. I'd always liked the financial side. I had always liked math, all of that piece. But I had entered UCD with the full intention of teaching and doing the BCOM and becoming a secondary <coughs> teacher and doing all of that. It all seemed very logical. And I think in about second year, somebody said to me, you know, accountancy is a great profession. Why not? Again, went home to my mum, that formidable lady, and I said, I think I'll do accountancy. What would you think of that? And she said, that's, that's a good idea. I know a guy down in the village. He's been out for about five or six years. I don't think he's qualified, but he's doing grand. So why don't you give it a shot? So I did. Uh, so she's always been constructively supportive, my mother. Um, so that was great. So uh, then I joined PwC as part of the And I have to say, I know I'm in a, in a law and you've been married, but the accounting qualification is very good. And it was a great grounding. You walk the terribly hard, as lots of folk do. But you do get that broad base of education and that broad base of oh, maybe that school of hard graft, which I think has always stood in a good stead. So they're great. Super organisation to be part of. I had the opportunity to go to Australia for a few years, it was newly married at that time, just post qualification, and we had a superb time. And then, of course, my husband, who was a guard at the time, decided that we really should move back to the sunny South East. And in the way of the world, I applied for a job in what was then North of Foods, who was a dairy business in the South. And again, I remember actually meeting somebody, and it was to head up an internal audit function for the first time. And I remember I met with somebody who told me many of us to this day and said, you won't get that job. And I said, why? And he said, that's a female. But I got the job, and, I had, and I'm 27 years there now, and it is just an incredibly powerful organization. And it is a fantastic organization to be part of, because if the dairy, Traditionally, very male orientated, traditionally maybe seen as quite safe. It is enormously innovative. It is a hugely export focused, innovative sector uh, here in Ireland, from which we have built what is today a very global organisation with over 6,600 employees across 34 countries with a very broad ambition for, for growth. So it's been a fantastic journey to be part of, and it's a huge privilege for me in my role now since 2013 to be Group Managing Director. I have a really interesting organisation because I'm also CEO of my life shareholder, Landy and Co-op. So that keeps us very grounded in rural Ireland and the community base here, but equally all the ambitions of a public organisation. So what would I say to you in terms of, you know, young folk thinking of the journey, maybe some of the learnings from, from my journey to date, so I'm not done yet, but a few things. I think firstly resilience is actually really important. You know, whether it is in your personal life or indeed absolutely in your professional life, life isn't linear. You'll have superb days and you'll have really challenging days. So having a personal resilience that can bring you through that is really, really important. And knowing your own points and, and having an infrastructure that you can lean into, having a great team around you, hugely important. You know, I'm a mother 
of two kids now. They're one is in the final year, one just graduated last year. Um, and there's no doubt that when you're raising a family and you're working full time, I'd be lying to you if I said it was easy. So it's hard, but you make that choice. And if you have a, an organisation that facilitates it and a team around you that supports it, it's a superb, superb choice to make. Uh, so I think resilience, building team, being aware of what you want. You know, don't sweat the small stuff. You don't need a big life plan. Folk often say to me, you know, did I join clinic, plan you 27 years ago, thinking with the ambition of being group managing director. I probably didn't. I most definitely didn't think I might even be there in 37 years. And I definitely wasn't thinking about the opportunity to be group managing director. In fact, you know, mentors and getting people around you that are supportive of what you want to do is hugely important. And I will always compliment and thank John Maloney, who was my predecessor. I was finance director with John, and then John decided to retire. And he really said to me, you know, what would you think would you be interested? And initially, like any piece where you're my child, you said, oh, I said, I'm so sure, really? And then he was very supportive. It was more the finance rather than the market. <coughs> and again, I think just encouraging yourself to stretch yourself. You will own your own career. And I think organisations now like that are getting so much better at helping you in your career. You always make you own it yourself. And I think taking that and how it reference the personal accountability to really you know, acknowledge what's right for you. And you see, it has to be right for you. I really believe that organisations like Landia, it's our job of work to create an environment that gives you choice. And it is your choice then to decide how you want to participate, what's right for you, and there can be ages and stages that have changes. And it's really empowering, I think, uh, to take that on board. So, I won't say anything else just now, but I'm happy to take any further questions you might have before the evening is done. Delighted to be here with you all, and I hope you enjoyed very much. Uh, Ian has already come across this, that idea of actually taking control of things and, and taking risks to which your career are not necessarily carrying too far away, but growing your career to your I think that's a very, very powerful thing in, in any career, and one, one sector that I've always believed in. Um, okay, so we've, so far we've got two farmers' daughters. Um, so, so we're going to break that tradition by introducing Andrew Keating, <laughs> who made farmers' daughters. <laughs> Um, Andrew joined uh, Bank of Ireland in 2004 as Director of Finance and became Group Chief Financial Officer in 2012. <coughs> He's recently announced that he will be leaving Bank of Ireland uh, to join CRH and Senior Finance Role. And it's interesting in uh, this respect that, uh, that Siobhan is on his board, uh, so he needs to behave himself tonight. Um, during his time in POI, Bank of Ireland, Andrew has worked hard in boosting the bank's diversity. I was instrumental in developing firms and vicious 50-50 by 2021, general charter for senior roles. <coughs> he also used to turn to charter to support working mothers. As executive sponsor for inclusion and diversity for the Bank Wire Group, he also advocates privacy on behalf of LGBT plus, cross-cultural, intergenerational and care groups. Thanks to this and the Okay, Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, so, I'm not a farmer's uh, daughter, uh, I'm not even a farmer's son. Um, so, uh, but I suppose I probably am the product of uh, my dad's determination and my mum's ways. Um, I suppose dad, his own father, died when he was 10 years of age, so the choice for him was to starve or to go to work at 13 years of age to feed his mum and his two sisters. And, and I suppose from his perspective, you know, he basically worked his whole life, spent 50 years working in, uh, in UCC uh, as a technician ultimately. Mo, uh, her case of fame was that she graduated at 71 with a master's degree. Um, and so what is interesting about that is the reason she actually went back to college. And um, the reason she went back to college is because she had to pay her. hers. So it was a uh, moment, a bit like she was a moment, and a huge, uh, um, put a huge amount of uh, store in education and about the importance of education for uh, everybody and for females in particular to realize the key vision of the vestige of the past. So the mom got friends with a lady called Elaine, who was in her mid twenties, mom was in her sixties at this stage, and Elaine had a school at her age of sort of sixteen uh, junior search. And mom said, this is not the way you in your twenties, you can go back to the university as a mature student. You don't need to be uh, you don't need to have a new research, etc. And Elaine, she had very low self-confidence, and she said, I was Susan, I couldn't do that, so I'd be 23, 24, I'd stand out. No problem, said Susan. 
I don't know, I'm in my 60s, so that you can write in the middle of the night for all the attention you're going to. So, um, so that was from my dad, and they were kind of a huge influence uh, on me, and then people that I do, and they're a huge inspiration to me. And in terms of my time within uh, Bank of Ireland, I know it says that I'm the CFO, but actually, you know, that's really my part-time job. My full-time job is, is as a chief university officer, and the CFO stuff is just, you know, kind of, you know, pays the mortgage and that's what I've got to say. So the job of chief university officer is something I've got to hand up for immediately, and then it became available, and I said I wanted to do that. And, and so one of, the, one of the inspirations for that was um, a question I was asked one day, so I get asked, you know, in the job, I get asked a thousand questions. And you know, you can kind of get very used to answer the questions and deal with that. The one question stands out over my seven and a half years of CFO. And the question is this, it said, Andrew, you know, you've been uh, successful in your career, you've achieved all your career ambitions to date. You know, would you have achieved the same ambition if you were born on her? Okay, and that was a really tough question for me to answer. If I was born in 1970, as Andrew, you know, or any would I have been as successful in terms of uh, getting to where I got to in the sort of time frame that I got to. And I couldn't answer the question, I had to find out for a while, and I suppose the only conclusion I could come to is that having been born in 1970, when I was in EJ in 1970, it was probably unlikely that I would have got to see a full of my at age of 41. And, and that didn't say very comfortably with me. The people didn't say comfortably with me because I have two kids, uh, Ashley is 13 and Dara is 10. And as we have a boy and a girl, I didn't want to, I didn't want Dara to have and enjoy the sort of unfair advantage of privilege that I enjoyed, and it came for centuries to enjoy it. So I didn't want Dara to have unfair advantage over Ashley, and equally I didn't want Ashley to have unfair advantage over Dara. I just wanted them to have uh, equality uh, for everybody. And so that's what kind of got me, I suppose, inspired me to take on the role of uh, diversity and inclusion within uh, that world. And uh, diversity is important, but of course, as we said, inclusion is not all right. And, and that's you know, kind of a huge uh, aspect of what we're trying to do. And we're trying to do that within the organisation and in fact for Irish, but also recognise that we have a role in the wider society because we get to operate in a town and village and country. There's an opportunity for us to show some leadership that we have this really critical agenda. And that's what we have in the 50 50 target. The other thing that we, we've done, um, I think I'm very proud of, is that like, you know, we back around at this stage is the Gold Zone Award. And you know, so the bank has a collection of gold sovereigns, and you say, well, you're a bank, well, wouldn't we have a collection of gold sovereigns? But the reason that we have the gold sovereigns in the collection is because of a very negative thing. And it's to do with what we call, that nobody probably in this room will remember or be aware of, people called Maritime. And what that meant is that for 40 years in Ireland's history, up to the early 1970s, if a lady in Bank of Ireland got married, she had to give up her job. You know, she had to give up her career, give everything up. Uh, and that was the end of the council legislation that was there at the time. So thankfully that's all gone in the past, right? But ultimately, at that moment, the bank, as it was when the lady got married and she had, uh, you know, was leaving, the bank gave the lady a sovereign coin as a sort of party um, token, a party gift, if you know. So we had this connection to this super negative piece, um, you know, kind of yeah, 45, 46 years ago. And when we came across this, about two years ago, we came across the connection, we said, what we're going to do, we should repurpose these. And the wrong that we used for such a negative use 45 years ago, we're now using it for a very positive uh, purpose. And the purpose we're going to do is we're going to use them to recognise and reward um, people who are doing fantastic work in the whole area of a huge university in the And um, within that context, we, we've been doing that for the last two years. And um, through the Margo has one of our, which was a very early, you know, the Sixth and Seventh Gold a couple of years ago. And even better, Margo has now been amongst a group of five people to be a group of what we're calling custodians. And so the custodians are going to come together every couple of months and effectively award these gold sovereign coins to people in society who are doing fantastic work in the whole area of the King's University. And that was something they did together with last week as part of their role. Both my parents were teachers. And when my eldest brother was born, she had to give up her job as well. And in the public service, that was the way it was in those days, which is just extraordinary to think of now. But to, to reclaim that history and use the gold sovereigns in such a positive, constructive way, I think is very good. And it, it's in the idea of, the, from the top of Bank of Ireland in this case, you have a signal that this is really, really important. And this is something that we all actually have to, to contribute to. So I think it's a very powerful, uh, powerful story. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, as, so we, we've uh, had three speakers uh, so far who've had a, a nearly an entirely business career, 
and so now we're, we're going to change temperature a little bit to Selena Naupu, and I was slightly worried about being able to pronounce Selena's name because she's played for Leinster and Connacht, but she's never played for Munster. If she played for Munster, I could definitely pronounce it. Um, so Selena is a senior executive with 17 plus years in sports development, high performance sport, sports business management and governance leadership roles, both in Ireland and abroad. She's also represented Ireland in Rugby 7s, 15s and Touch Rugby across three World Series uh, seasons, four European Championships, two World Cups and five Six Nations campaigns, which is extraordinary. The current uh, Leinster Women's Rugby captain won the BNY Mellon Players Player of the Year and the Guinness Rugby Writers Player of the Year in 2016 and was named Irish Times Top 30 Most Influential Women in 2017. As part of the Rugby Athletes Commission and Global Players Council with International Rugby Players, Sen is uh, helping to lead the global agenda commercialising the women's game and has contributed at various IOC, EOC, IF and WADA uh, forums and meetings for Rugby Europe and World Rugby. She has founded companies aimed at promoting uh, sports involvement from leadership to participation to high performance. Her recent startup, SportsGAF, supports uh, athletic performance across targeted national governing bodies. Sene also works with top commercial broadcast and media partners promoting women in sport and business. In 2019, the Junior Chamber International awarded Sene the top 10 outstanding young persons in Ireland for her contribution to the community and to culture. I'm delighted to introduce Sene. First, I actually must apologise, it's my fault that we were late, <laughs> so thank you very much for your patience. Um, before I start, I actually want to get a show of hands in terms of those who are involved in sport or keep active or do some sort of fitness. Incredible, nice and high, nice and high. I'm trying to gauge a bit of a percentage, I want to read my room. And then the rest will probably fall asleep from my talk for five minutes. Um, okay, so basically, um, my name is Senet, and you pronounced it perfectly, uh, really, really perfectly. And I'm not a uh, daughter of a farmer's daughter or <laughs> a farmer's son. I, um, I'm obviously, uh, I don't look Irish. Um, I'm a New Zealand-born Samoan. I've lived uh, in Ireland for the best part of 10 years. Um, two of those years, uh, was one was in England and one was in Japan. Um, I suppose I want to give you a bit of context of my upbringing really, really quickly. Uh, so I grew up in a really, really small town in New Zealand. I'm not sure if anyone has been there. Has anyone been to New Zealand? South Island? Oh my goodness, we have some people. Whereabouts? Amazing. Whereabouts have you? What about you? Oh, incredible. So I'm uh, not near Auckland, <laughs> I'm not near Queenstown. Um, I'm a few hours from Queenstown, actually. Um, small town of north of Otago, Omaru. Um, I grew up uh, the youngest of four, and when I was two, uh, my parents separated, you know, divorced, so my mum raised four of us by herself. Um, and I suppose as I grew up, very quickly I learnt um, what a role model looks like. You know, so I was brought up in an environment where, um, you know, not much money, tiny house, but my mum's out there in the community, you know, bringing, finding friends and starting a Pacific Island community group in, a, in an area that was predominantly uh, European, so we were probably one of the only Samoan families um, at the time in this very, very small town. Um, and this year is the 30th anniversary of the Pacific Island community that my mum started. Um, and probably one of the fastest, it actually was named the fastest growing um, Pacific Island town in New Zealand. So a lot of the funding is actually going towards the program that my mum started back all those years. Um, so I suppose that gives a bit of context in terms of the environment I grew up in. Um, so throughout high school and all, you know, college I was very, very sporty. Um, loved basketball, loved all the sports. Um, and so I went to university and you know, did sport and performance, um, Bachelor of Commerce, I you know, did marketing and communication studies. And um, one thing that I found was really, really strange, for some reason, when I was doing financial business accounting, the paper, something stuck out to me, and it was the acronym NPV. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that. Back in the day, like, I don't know, 20 years ago when I was in university, um, this net profit value, like, for some reason, it just kind of out of my head um, and so when I had graduated I, um, I ended up uh, using my graduate loan and I might ask my mum because we had this tiny house you know 
massive backyard, but a really, really small house that needed work done. Um, and I used my graduate, graduate later and I asked my mum, I was like, uh, can I just sort of smash the wall down, put a new kitchen in, put a, you know, like, had asked if I could do all this, because I, for some reason, you know, I thought I could, I just had no fear growing up for some reason. Um, I ended up doing it. Um, then we sold the house and, you know, from the age of my mid-20s, I ended up making, money. we bought another house, a big house, and that was my first taste of um, change. That was my first taste of, um, I suppose, maybe my naivety um, at the time, that it kind of worked in that moment. It doesn't always work, but I was very, very fortunate, really grateful for the opportunity to even, um, I suppose, be in a position that I could help my family in that way. So I think that, for me, has stood really well moving forward. Um, uh, I met my husband shortly around the time that we were renovating the house. Um, he wasn't my husband at the time, obviously, he was my partner. I, I met him at the time, um, and he then was a professional rugby player, so we ended up travelling the world, so I was really grateful to have lived in places like Japan and England, and his career actually brought me to Ireland in the first place. Um, so really, really grateful for all of the kind of experiences from a travel point of view, a cultural experience point of view. And, and then I suppose my business sense in some sort of way, I'm still absolutely learning from absolutely amazing experts and, and you guys and, and you know, society in general. But um, when we lived in Japan, I you know, very quickly learned that um, it's kind of, when you see something you know you can market, you know, for example, we lived in a small island, Rocco Island, Kobe, where the Irish men's were based last week, um, predominantly expats. So no one else could speak English. It's not only like they could speak English, but no one else could train them. So that's when you know I started to use, you know, get involved in business type thing there. And we moved to Ireland, and really, really fortunate to meet some fantastic Irish um, friends of ours in Galway and Barana uh, Anadown. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that area in Galway. Um, and they were fantastic, and we set up a business together there about um, when was it? Uh, 2013. Um, and that was a health and lifestyle brand, and we had transitioned that um, from, a, uh, from a group fitness kind of franchise, and we had franchised it all over you know, Galway and um, some in Athlone, and when we moved to London, I ended up franchising it into uh, gyms like Third Space, some, uh, some of the big gyms in, in London, Soho, Kerry Wharf, Tower Bridge. So that was really, really cool. Um, at the same time, I was training and playing uh, for Island, Island Sevens, uh, National Sevens program, National Fifteens program, and more recently the Touch Rugby program. So, um, really, really grateful to do a you know, you know, a bit of business and then a bit of sport. Um, so, I suppose um, fast forwarding to now. Um, so we'd sold that business a couple of years ago and have been involved in a new initiative, Sportscape, which you mentioned. Um, where you know the idea was that we connect uh, you know clubs, sports teams, schools, individual athletes with coaching support and, and administrative support, and a lot of that you know was was kind of uh, came from the idea and some support from people I met and you know NGPs, LSPs uh, that I met through studying a masters of sport management actually in uh, UCD. Um, so that was really fantastic, and we had learned from Siobhan earlier. Um, about you know gravitating to you know attracting kind of those relationships relationships to mentor you through things and certainly that's what's happened to me um, since I've moved to, to Ireland so yeah um, I'll cut this short but basically that's a bit of my background a uh, little bit of what I do now um, I'm actually really grateful to actually do some work with Bank of Ireland and have some of the master roles with the master, uh, with Bank of Ireland which is really really super yesterday we had um, uh, really fortunate to attract you know, brands like Adidas and Bank of Ireland to support an initiative that Sports Gav um, uh, did yesterday with the over 100, 100 kids, you know, just coaching and things like that. So there's a lot of that sort of stuff um, that we've been doing lately as well as um, uh, training for the National 15 squad. So I'm sure we will see each other again when we're up in the seats. But thanks very much for having me here tonight. Yeah, we, we don't have any place names on the seats. <laughs> I'm going to pass that over. But we, we, we take questions. Can I, can I just kick off tonight just by, by one question? And <laughs> I had exactly said they happened to me earlier. It's the theme of today's raining. Um, 
I think that we're at a stage now in society and in business where the, the business case for diversity and inclusion is just a given. And you know, policies in relation to it are well established and structures are well established. But in terms of people being an agent for change, what do you think are the small things that make a big difference? The things that actually really make a difference in people's lives in inclusiveness in the in the um, in a business environment or a sporting environment or other environment. Because in many ways it's on a daily basis I think some of those things can be most powerful. Who would like to do you, do you want me to kick off should Siobhan looked very interested in answering that question. Say again? <laughs> yeah, you looked very interested in answering that question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think, you know, your core point is obviously absolutely right. You know, the policies have to be there to set the bedrock, really, and to have something sustainable. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think, rightly, it is very much beyond that now. And it is very much, it is behavioural, I think, you know, because ultimately the culture of an organisation is really what determines the extent to which these areas live and breathe. And, and culture is a very live and breathing thing. So my own view would be that it is really about walking the talk. And it is about authenticity, to your point. And it, sometimes it doesn't need to be any, you know, anything grandiose, because the policies, they'll set it all in stone, but you have to have an organization that, that embraces inclusion. And, it, and to your point, I think it, it has gone from diversity to be inclusion, because diversity is what it is. But the whole thing, if you, once you get people in and have that policy to ensure that, it is about people feeling included, feel, people feeling empowered, people enjoying it. So one of the things that we've done in our organisation, particularly I would say in probably the last four or five years, is really work hard as a team to make the culture live and breathe. And one of our core values actually is respect. And we did our first global survey not long after I was appointed. And to be very frank, actually, we didn't like how we were looking on that metric. And it, it wasn't that it was horrible, but you know, it just wasn't as good as we wanted. So we said, actually, we're going to do something really simple. We're going to make it a core value. And it very much has resonated across the organization and all sorts of things from events right across the globe and, and people will absolutely embrace it if it comes from the leadership team so i think um you know not to go on too much about it but i think it is about being authentic it is about walking the talk it is about the whole of the leadership really you know not putting posters on walls but just living it and then allowing it actually to develop organically and encourage, you know, there's so many things we can do in organisations and, and one of the things I forgot to reference at the outset, I, my advice to young folk like we have here, is pick something that you love. Because ultimately one of the things we say is having fun is really important. So if you can create events that are by their very nature promoting inclusion and diversity, but you're not calling it that, it's just organically getting developed, I, I think it's hugely powerful. Yeah. Don't want to vibe with Andrew. I probably just a, a couple of points, and not disagreeing with Siobhan, um, and certainly everything she says I would agree with, but I guess I probably have a slightly more cynical view and say that I think we still have a way to go. Um, so I'll give you an example, for instance, uh, we tendered recently for um, an in Employee engagement process, large company, you know, uh, pretty big chunk of contract for people, uh, for companies. And we, we narrowed it down to six companies, um, mostly all startups, because we wanted to do something radically different. And, you know, of the companies who came in to us, four out of the five we brought it, came in and were mostly male. Now, I'm not being anti-male, I'm actually saying, if they'd actually looked at the, the sheet that were given, the script sheet, and they actually read the names of the people, and they took the time to even Google and find out who they were and what they were interested in, which is what I do when I go to anything, I would have actually known and understood that I, I would at least try to represent, and I'm just talking on a gender perspective, not anything else. Um, 
my, my, my viewpoint in this country is that I think if you're in a large organization, you live and see and feel inclusion, but I think it's still lacking in small SMEs, when you get outside of the core of the big cities. Um, and I still think in, in language, I mean, I take sport, and I'm, I'm probably just picking something that I, I'm very passionate about sport, but you know, the Irish rugby team is usually referred to as the Irish rugby team, whereas what they actually mean is the Irish men's rugby team. You know, um, Irish hockey has, has begun to change things, as of the women's rugby team, same with football, but my God, it's a slow journey. Um, the funding slow. So, and Andrew will know I'm passionate about this, but women on boards is slow, everything's taking time. So I'm, 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 I'm happy about where we've got to, but I think we still have a ways to go. And probably my last quip is around language. Um, we still use, you know, so many things as the chairman and all that, and language, and we're conservative. So I think we, we still need to change and companies need to change. So maybe, yeah, I mean, I suppose, you know, again, maybe going back to some of what you were asking, but you know, in terms of some of that inclusion, one of the things that we have found in terms of the journey within Bank of Ireland, because I would say Bank of Ireland were probably late to this game a little bit, I'd say we probably really got going in anger maybe about three or four years ago. But one of the things that we have found has been a huge accelerant for us as an organisation has been making the thing um, democratised, or basically getting everybody involved and doing it. Um, and basically people now have an opportunity no matter what part of the organisation they're in, to actually make a real difference to the culture of the organisation and to what's actually happening. And there's a fantastic um, example, maybe if I just take two minutes on, <coughs> a lady called um, Noella uh, McCormick. So Noella one day was in tears of frustration and she basically said, actually I have to leave back of Ireland. She was a very kind of public forum like this and she stood up and said, actually I'm just, you know, bawling crying, I have to go. And her frustration was that she couldn't breastfeed her son who was about eight or nine months old at that stage, and there was no facilities in the bank, and she couldn't you know, arrange to get home and sort all that out. So, in a way, she said, that's it, actually, I'm just gonna resign today. Um, and her, the response from her line managers were, was fantastic. Um, and after that, uh, they put a structure in place for Noella, but actually Noella then went on to, you know, to write the group's breastfeeding policy, and more than that, she's gone on to now do an audit of all the buildings to make sure we have appropriate lactation facilities in every building. And these are really complicated things like a lock on the door or a fridge, like really, you know, high-tech stuff. Noella said recently to somebody, she's like, my career is so important to me, but I, I will never work anywhere but Bank of Ireland because of the opportunities it gave her. And so in terms of the kind of the, the you know, it's a tiny micro example, but there is somebody who, you know, had gone from the point of leaving to the point of actually refusing to leave. Um, through the whole uh, getting involved in and creating a leadership staff in terms of the organisation. Very good. I'll be really quick, maybe from three different perspectives and I'll be really quick. Um, so one, uh, as a board director for National Charity Body Wise, really quick example, um, recently, so I've been, I'm uh, chairing a working group where we're facilitating a new project that we can implement into the coaching programs for Sport Island, where we're, um, there's a lot of research that is um, in some ways uh, lacking in terms of uh, eating disorders in sport in a sporting context and how that can be useful for coaches so anyway long story short in chairing this working group um, we had our you know different types of people that we, we knew that we needed to get in we had our list of ideal you know members in there and then we also had another list a contingency list um, and because recently, you know, I one of my research, one of my thesis is all around on change management, you know, strong governance system and what success in women's sport looks like from a brand equity point of view. Um, and so for me personally, good governance is quite, you know, a priority for me. So within this, I remember very vividly, <laughs> like a month ago, um, thinking for myself, it's a no-brainer uh, in terms of ensuring the diversity of our working group. You know, we needed an athlete in there. We needed these sorts of people and we needed the gender balance. And um, I just found it uh, interesting, which is, you know, absolutely I'm still learning in this space. Um, but yeah, it was interesting that um, sometimes conversations uh, uh, come across as being surprising, that it's balance, as in it should be like that. So sorry, that's just a really quick example. But that was very recent, so as you're saying, it's almost 
it's getting there, it's not the year in terms of that trip in that space. Um, and a really quick example from a, I suppose from a um, rugby union point of view and globally, um, in the last two, th two years, two and a half years, I, I, uh, I'm on the Athletes Commission where I represent the women's game in the 15s and 7s. So there's two of us that go to these meetings and present on behalf of um, the women's internationals game, really, so to world rugby. So we proposed certain things. The latest one was um, where I led the agenda and commercialising the women's game. And so we had to go quite deep into that, that space. But um, a lot of it needed to rely on the culture change. It needed to rely on um, ensuring the relationships with um, our GM, Katie Sadley, a super friend of mine who was a uh, GM for World Rugby, where she then had to do the leadership workshops to educate um, governance, governance from different unions to, you know, you know, show them this is what it looks like. And, and you know, a year after that, it's, rugby is one of the, women's rugby is one of the fastest growing team sports in the world and the non-traditional markets like Asia's, um, you know, in, in, in India, especially Iran is one of the um, fastest growing, you know, countries for the sport because of the education piece and because of ensuring that we have someone in that space to educate around the inclusion and diversity of the board. So I think from a government's point of view, it's, um, it's getting there. Thank you for that. Can I pick up just on one theme that came through a few uh, different comments, and, and you mentioned it very explicitly, Margot, is, is the, the idea of language and how important language is, because I think the stories we tell as you know, senior leaders particularly, and you know, senior leaders have traditionally been male, so there's a lot of male stories coming down that people, it's hard for people to relate to. There are, I mean, something that, that I really have to check myself on all the time is there's this default for guys, particularly when you're starting a meeting, that you just talk about the rugby, or you talk about the whatever the, the sport, and there's people often in the room that actually will not necessarily relate to that, and yet it's a default. It's an easy way of doing things. There's plenty of you on the panel tonight who would relate to that, but but generally speaking, and that's actually that's that's both genders, uh, interestingly. Um, I remember years ago when I was a student in the states, and this goes back 30 years. It was something that made a really big impact on me. It was a tiny thing. It was in studying law. When we were talking about uh, case law, there were one or two professors that every single article that they would write, when they were referring to a judge, they would say, they would say she as much as he. So, so, so rather than simply automatic, automatically deferring to a judge, he, because they would say she. And it was really interesting because, of course, I perfectly knew, you know, the women were judges and brilliant judges, but it was such a different thing in the use of language that every time. Somebody would talk about innovation, and they'd talk about a judge. You'd see a woman, and I think the the power of language in relation to all the small, you know, things that we do and how we uh, interact with people and how inclusive we are with people, is is one of the real keys here. I think in in developing much further because I agree we're not there yet, but but we're getting there. Um, we we'll take some questions from the audience, perhaps. I think we have a do we have a, a mic? If we don't have a mic, I can do mine. I'll be Oprah. Um, hello. Um, it was really good hearing from all of you. I just have a doubt. So there was this recent movement called Me Too Movement, which happened in Hollywood, where all women reported their harassment stories. So as CEOs, I want to ask, have you come across such stories, not in your current companies, but like in your past companies or throughout your career, have you ever come across such experiences which you know which happened? And if yes, how did you tackle it or what you did uh, personally to tackle the situation? I'm, I'm sorry, this is a bit controversial, but it's just, <laughs> it's just a strike to mind. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Who would like to answer that? So, um, I'm not a CEO now, but I was. Um, have I come across that yet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we employ in Ireland just under about 4,000 people, so you, you, you don't run a company and not have that happen. Um, uh, I would say it's, it's not a new story. Um, it's, it's something that has been happening uh, for a very long time. What is probably good now is that people actually report it um, and that you know other people will also say that they see something or they've seen a behavior, etc. 
and I think, um, and I'll come back to the reporting piece, but I also think what is really good is that as organizations, we're so much more conscientized around how we set up, you know, where people are working together, what might happen, and the, you know, the, the danger of, for instance, uh, social events, so many things, because these were often the places where a lot of these things happened, or where power play came into being. Um, and in our organization, and personally, whenever I would have come across it, uh, because having come through the hotel and catering industry, particularly for 20-something odd years, I've seen loads of sexual harassment. It's, and when I, was, when I was a wee young one in, in, in those early days in that industry, it was commonplace. Um, and people put up with it and didn't say no and didn't, didn't, didn't report. So I suppose I would be, I'd be a strong reporter that you should. So um, when I was in a position, my, my stance was always, you know, if you want to report it, then you, I would be supportive 100%, but I'd also say to somebody, then you need to be able to do that, you need to be able to give evidence, because you also have to be fair, because um, things would happen, but absolutely stand behind it, have policy, have a procedure, and, and make sure you support people, but also to make sure that it's fair and that it's balanced, and I've, I've, I've seen it from both genders as well. Yeah, I, I think as you say, you know, it is obviously a very fair question. I, I'd have to, I was probably fortunate, I never had a dramatic experience, I have to say, thankfully. Um, but I think the point of language is actually really important. And that has evolved, you know, what was a language that was probably not even questioned at one level, historically, is validly now just not a language that we would entertain. And I think that's good. So, you know, it's, it's all, it's, it's evolved. And I think it absolutely, it's about creating a culture that, it, that just would not have certain behaviors or language as acceptable and be pretty ruthlessly clear about that. Um, and, then, and if that is the culture, again, that is authentic to the organization, um, and the values, you know, again, I come back to that, you know, because cult you have to have, it has to be just be part of the air and water because you can't force it. And then, of course, if something happens that isn't part of the air and water, you stand on it hard. Do you have other questions? Oh, come on. Oh, here's one. Hi, good evening. My name is Linda. I found my way here uh, through the SMF Mentorship Program and I really enjoyed listening to your stories and I think it's really nice for everybody here uh, to know that it's a journey and that they don't need to be scared if they don't know exactly what they're going to do after uni. Um, my question ties to uh, Siobhan, to your, um, where you mentioned authenticity and I think it's really important and uh, like knowing yourself is really key for you to be able to be authentic. My question is, these days with uh, social media, you see all day uh, everybody's uh, profiles, and I think sometimes you get a little bit brainwashed about who you really are and what you stand for. Sometimes I have to stand back and I have to look at my own social, uh, social media profile and have to see, is this Linda? Is this who people, do I reflect what my beliefs are? Um, so my question is, do you think it's more difficult these days to be authentic or is it easier? I know social platforms also help you to sort of, uh, you know, spread your story and your beliefs. Um, or do you, yeah, just from your perspective, is it more challenging or is it easier to be authentic? I honestly think um, it is probably harder on you folk um, in, so, in many ways, albeit that technology is hugely enabling and fantastically powerful. You have such a weight of influence. Um, now, I, I am not a social media participant, so I can say that up front. Um, and, but I, I do think, to your point, and which is great that you, I think, you know, are approaching it so consciously, because I think you actually have to, so that it is a conscious choice that you are determining who you want to be and how you're representing that and owning that yourself and, and having the maturity to you know, be who you are and true to yourself. I, I think it's harder because of the weight of that influence and I have younger nieces and nephews of my own even and I can see that that influence is so strong and I think, you know, as we think 
your younger folk even than you, who are really born and bred in that world of all pervasive intervention. Um, I think having, building self-confidence and resilience is a real job of work of my generation and the next one to just, you know, empower young people to, to be themselves, good and bad as that is. And as an inclusiveness exactly, it's not what generates the authenticity, it generates the environment which you can be authentic, which is presumably where we need to go with all of this. So if, for you, um, so you're maybe slightly younger than the other members of the panel, so you're probably a little bit more social media savvy, and, and you've been in rugby, you've been in Junior rugby. Do you hear about I said a little bit, oh, March. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been in rugby and you've been in business, so, so you've, been in, <laughs> you've been in the public eye probably quite a bit as well. So how do you deal with that? that question? Um, well firstly I'm, I'm usually the oldest in my team and like I said um, <coughs> such a good point such a great question in yours yourself I think um, you know authenticity with, within, in that social media space um, the context is what the polar, you polarise to in terms of your feed so whatever comes up if that's your environment then you've got to change it if it's not healthy obviously um, uh, really quickly, you know, say for me over the last number of years, um, social media has been a, a positive thing in terms of me actually realising that I need to be true to myself and, you know, my teammates and those who are involved in sport where girls are looking to, you know, the, the, the girls or, or female, the teams of, you know, in Ireland or, or around the world. Um, I think that that social change and that social impact has actually been really positive to ensure that uh, girls playing sport who are representative of their province or their club or their country, that they have a voice to remind young girls that it's okay to be you and um, that's actually important to your, be your best self. And certainly for, for me, um, the last couple of years, the last sort of 12, 13 months, um, I've done a lot of work around the schools, reminding girls um, to be themselves, to be the authentic selves. Um, so I suppose at the end of the day, it's what you're polarised to in the context of that social media space. Um, and as long as you're um, you know, self-aware enough to surround yourself with the healthy environment, whether it's on the social media space and in person, physically, and um, with what you know will be contributing to your best self, whether it's um, sport or art or uh, theatre or whatever it is, that's really, really important to express yourself that way. Andrew? So I think, um, you know, I think the, the, this idea about being authentic, you know, and if I was to, to borrow the phrase from the LGBT community, this idea about bringing your whole self to work, you know, is very much in that space. And I couldn't encourage people to do that uh, enough. Um, as much because actually I didn't do that for, for many years. I was, I suppose, even for the first probably half of my career as CFO of the bank, I probably behaved in a way that was more consistent with how I thought other people would expect me to behave when they said, I said, oh, gosh, people think the CFO of the bank should be behaving in a particular way, you know, kind of whatever, very analytical or intellectual or, you know, etc. And I didn't bring all the other aspects of my, uh, of my personality to work every day. So, you know, I suppose when I talk about my dreamer or my lover aspect of that, they all got left at home with the family. And then I kind of, so I was going to half myself um, for the first three or four years as being the CFO. And then I went to one of these programs and came back from that and actually, you know, really bought into this idea about bringing my whole self to work. And actually, you know, that's when I got involved in things like inclusion and diversity. And that has been, you know, revolutionary for me in terms of my authenticity and my ability to act as a leader within our organisation um, and to be able to, you know, to, you know, to bring all that uh, aspect of my career. It's also meant I have massively enjoyed my job, you know what I mean, way more than in the first uh, uh, couple of years where I was more focused on the kind of the more stereotypical aspects of the kind of the uh, classical CFO or accountant type, type piece. So, you know, in terms of that idea about being authentic, you know, creating an environment and working in an environment where you can actually be yourself um, and bring all that aspect of yourself to work is so, so important. Uh, and if the organisation or if the environment doesn't uh, empower that, you know, you, you, you need to kind of think about can you change the environment or maybe you need to change from that environment. Just last comment, I'll make it very short. I think around social media and things, um, and I'm probably, you know, somebody who, I, I do use social media a lot more sort of 
it's a, it's a kind of a distraction from day-to-day -day stuff. But I think you've got to decide if you're going to be on social media, are you being on it for yourself or are you doing it for PR reasons? And so most of my, most of my things like Facebook, Instagram and stuff are just stuff I do with my friends. So I never put anything up on Facebook that I don't feel comfortable to share. Um, if, if there was something I didn't want to share, well, I won't use it there. And if it's PR, it's obviously done through a different format. But, you know, if you're, if, if, if you're doing it and it's just to, to, to win uh, millions of followers and do that, well, then that's a different kind of thing. But if you're, if you're doing it because it's about you, well, then you're never going to... I think just trust in your instincts about that. But I'd also, I suppose, I'm just like everybody else, I see, particularly, uh, probably in the LGBT community, that, you know, my God, poor people who put something up and, and, and they don't mean it or they said something just for, they're angry about something and, oh my God, you know, they get, they get thousands of people giving them a really hard time. So I'm probably careful about that and, and think about it like that, but I'd never deviate from just being yourself and be true to that. Can I also make just one final observation on this, which is that in my experience of life, to people who are really, really successful, right? really hyper successful, are all authentic. They really are themselves. And you can see this in the panel in front of you, right? So you've got four very successful people and you can see how authentic each one of those people are. So there are times, and we all suffer it, whereby you feel you should be this, you should be that, but the truth is actually being yourself in the long term is really what, what wins out. And, and that is very true in terms of most leaders, I would say. Do we Hi, thank you so much for coming here tonight. Uh, I was just wanted to say that I think like communication is really important in the business world, but oftentimes how you talk, how you speak has a big effect. Um, something like your accent, your style of speech, your pitch, or even I once got given out to at work because I said like too much. Um, I was just wondering if you have any experience in this, because you can really knock um, people's confidence and have a big effect on the workplace. And I also was wondering if you think the business world is changing in regards to, you know, judging people on their kind of uh, form of language. I'll just start because I had the microphone by the very near, very fast, and then I'll pass it around. Um, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, you know, you can be judged a lot about how you speak and how you are. I think one of the beautiful advantages of getting older in life is that you care less. Um, and when I when I was younger and and I was in you know being in a global company and when I would go on calls I was very conscious of my Irish accent my Limerick accent my country accent and how I would say things. Um, really now I don't give a a toss. Um, I, I obviously am very conscious to speak slower and I'm trying now. <laughs> uh, but it's it's that's actually probably the biggest struggle and my very bad pronunciation of French. Because I work for a French company, and uh, you know when when you when you can't even use their language very well, and uh, Duolingo is still a struggle for me. Um, but I think um, I would. It's a bit like sort of the last conversation about authenticity. I'm now at a stage where this is me. This is how I speak. This is this is what I am, and 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 what you get is what you see. So I, I'm proud of it. Um, and I wouldn't change it. And I love the fact that in our organisation, people from all around the world, you know, and, and we have people, and we we learn through cultural navigators and everything to to be understanding of other people's differences. So um, that's my sort of bit on it. I'm not sure if I answered the question, but uh, that's my my feeling. So you know, again, I think you know, from my own experience, um. You know, I, when I took on the job first, you know, an important part of it was presenting the results of the bank every kind of half year, and I was really rubbish at the start, like really rubbish. But I got some help, and some people came in and helped me, and kind of coached me, you know, in terms of how to be better, and how to kind of be more engaging in terms of that piece. But actually, I ended up getting um, almost overtrained, uh, if that makes sense. So at one stage, we ended up having kind of like auto cubes, like kind of, you know, um, the whole thing was down to a very fine art. And while it kind of came across okay, actually people said it was actually very false and actually it was almost too perfect. So actually since then, we've kind of ditched the auto queue and now it's much more relaxed and therefore it's much more authentic. And that authenticity, you know, the real person coming out is much more engaging, it's much more interesting for the audience. And ultimately that's what communication about is about. It's not about communicating with the person who's speaking, it's about communicating with the, the people that you're actually engaging with. 
Yeah, I, I won't add much I, I, because I completely agree. I mean, honestly, it really comes back to that authenticity point. And if you're passionate about something and there's a bit of colour coming into the conversation, that's because you care. So I actually prefer people who really believe in something. And sometimes, you know, there might be kind of a, a good or robust conversation. As long as you never tip into, you know, anything, and we never would tip into anything that's, you know, upsetting or anything like that. But if you really, really feel passionate about something, just be yourself. And recognise, of course, you know, in public organisations there's a formality and you can't be sometimes yourself entirely because that might be entirely healthy. But, you know, generally outside the formality pieces, kind of, over, I would agree, don't overcook it, you know, because again, that thing, it's very hard to fake being yourself. Just be yourself, talk to it and then it'll be fine. Again, there's not much to add to these experts, these three experts. Um, I suppose from a sporting context, um, uh, both from a national level, so um, great for to be vice captain for the national women's team. So we're very big on, say, from a sports context, the language and, and ensuring that our players are using empowering language as opposed to negative, um, disempowering language. Um, from both a national point of view and um, captaining the province at Leinster, so I'm very big on, um, you know, encouraging an environment where. So with our core leadership group, we have our, you know. Uh, we have tactical leaders, line-out leaders, uh, defence leaders, social entertainment leaders. So we have the, the sort of five key core formal roles and then informal roles, contingencies to that. So a lot of what we needed to build the culture around was ensuring that it was an environment that, you know, whether you're a senior player or you're a young player, everyone has a voice. Um, but the way you use that voice, we always try to encourage that, you know, it's obviously um, productive and sort of... Uh, this is a problem that I actually live all the time because my wife is French and my little eight-year-old daughter speaks French fluently and every time I try to speak French she starts laughing firstly and then gets radically embarrassed and gets me to stop. So we'll we have, we have one more question. I think we have time for one more question. Um, hi. Um, so I was wondering, um, you know like you're obviously all very successful in your careers but even like in such high positions, do you like still experience sexism or are there like incidents where you would say like being male would still be easier? And especially like in regards to like the wage gap, do you think you'd be making more money if you were male? Who would like to? Yeah. So I'm trying to remember all the things in the question. Um, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're still in a very imperfect world. So absolutely we experience all of those things. Um, in, in, in my organization, for instance, our big goal, I'm, I'm looking at our strategy at the moment around what we want to achieve and one of the things, and I'm particularly thinking around inclusion, is uh, gender, gender pay, pay equity rather than sort of the gender pay gap. And we're looking at probably 2025 to, to equalize that. Now, for a big global company, that's a, an, an you know, audacious goal. And, probably going to be a financial struggle challenge, but um, I think it's it's most definitely still a challenge out there. Um, I would say that, you know, Ireland, Europe, globally, the world, there are so many organizations not even going down this route. It's still very, very far behind. Do I still experience sexism? Yeah. Um, it's probably been a little bit less so in the last number of years, but I'll give you a very sort of, um, Real example for me when I when I first did, started in 2012 as CEOs of our company, I had a I had a sort of a I used to quite often take people out for dinner who would be clients etc. And I'd quite often take my wife and I'd say to the client if it was a man bring your partner so sometimes a woman sometimes a man mostly a woman, but nine times out of ten when we would be at the restaurant and you would uh, and I would have been the host hostess, whatever one you want to put on it, people would come to the male who was at the table and give him the bill. And yet, you know, I was the person who was credit card and was paying. So, um, do I experience that? Do you, people make gender references to you? Um, occasionally, and I mean, I think, um, you know, probably most people know I'm gay, but people still say to me, oh, are you married? And I say, yeah. And they say, what did your husband do? You know, these kind of things. Everyday sexism is there everywhere in, in life. Um, I try to get into a scenario where I say that most people are learning and I'm careful not to be vicious with people and to try to say, so if somebody says that to me now I say, 
I actually am married, but she's actually Sarah, and I just go like that and, and be kind about it because, and do you know what, when you're kind like that, people will say, oh God, I'm terribly sorry, I didn't realize. And, and I think, you know, you, you, you educate people by peace, by peace. So that's my viewpoint. Um, I could go on a lot longer, but I'll share. I, I'm not sure if I missed, I might have missed some of the question, but I think to, to that core point, you know, the reality is it's still a journey. You know, this is a journey that is by no means complete. Um, I, I often reference when I was made CEO of Glanby in 2013, uh, and I, I call it the curiosity factor. And I remember saying to my colleagues in at work, saying, and, they, and my team are mostly guys, um, what is, in truth now, I genuinely think, like, what is this all about? This is kind of mad. I didn't expect this curiosity factor to be as strong. And they say to me, well, really? Um, and, and I think that's just the point because, you know, I came from an environment, and maybe rural Ireland is surprising to some, it, it just was never an issue as I was going up through my career that, that I happened to be a female. And I have regularly had interviews, and the starting point will be, Okay, Siobhan, you're a CEO and you're female. And I say, yes, you're really smart. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, yes. And then we go on from there. So you do have these bizarre situations sometimes. And I had a funny story one time, I remember, I think it was probably one of the, I, I think I was finance director at the time, and my husband was with me. He came with me to pick my car. And I went into one of the, uh, the garages, and the guy had the entire conversation with my husband. Until at one point, I think about 10 minutes into the conversation, Billy turned to me and said, Siobhan's actually getting the car. It's got, you know, I'm not just here kind of to see what I think of the colour as well. And it was just those, you, you come across that all the time. And, you know, you're nice to people. It, sometimes it can be just that tips to the point of irritation uh, and most people you know mean nothing by it but again it is a language piece I think it will evolve uh, a tiny little example I would give you know and I often reference it my mum is 82 my daughter's 23 mum had to give up work even though she when she married because of the ban uh, and she went back in I mean the the level of opportunity now that Alice has versus mom is just Eons different, and we've come such a long way. So I think there will be a natural progression here that will come over time, but we have to check ourselves to make sure that there isn't presumption right across the board um, in whatever form of diversity we're thinking. And, and that's an individual thing that we can all influence. So, you know, certainly in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, dealing with things like the gender pay gap, I mean, I think the analytics that actually works there, you know, really work to, um, to, to the advantage of actually kind of driving this agenda forward. Um, I know we did, uh, we did a, an exercise internally within the bank um, in terms of getting ready for the gender pay gap, and our gender pay gap is about 24%, I think, is where the maths comes out at. And so we're kind of conscious that that's not great, we're kind of horrified a little bit about that. So we, we basically did another piece of maths which said, right, equalize everybody, pay everybody the same, um, just for example, if you like, and rerun the analysis. And it came out that the pay gap, even though everybody was paying at the same, at the same rank, were paid, there was a 22% pay gap, okay? So, you know, the issue being there was much more about a representation gap than a pay gap. So, because we have all sorts of policies, I mean, it's, it's, there's legislation which says you can't pay a man and a woman a different amount of money for doing the same job, there's all sorts of, that's all complex, etc. But it is about putting in place structures that actually draw attention to potential issues. And that's where the job like for people who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And, you know, about to join the latter category in the next couple of months, you know, like ultimately there was actually a very marked difference in terms of people in their 50s tended to be much more clustered around kind of meeting expectations, and people in their 40s were clustered much more around exceeding expectations. So we're working through that process now and saying, okay, by actually by putting those structures in place and by challenging ourselves, we say we need to see what the analysis looks like. Um, it doesn't mean to say there's a, there's a problem, but it, do, it does help to draw attention to it, and it does give comfort and confidence that actually we're t testing that out and making sure that there isn't unconscious biases or even conscious biases creeping into to, to what people are doing. Uh, so did you want to finish up? If we are Okay, perfect. Way longer, just really quickly, maybe a recent example of how I think it's it's starting to shift a tiny bit. Um, you can't compare the woman and men's game. You can't compare at the moment, you know, in terms of the, the 
you know, the pay isn't, you know, in time it will, um, but more recently in terms of, say, commercial partners that we work with, um, we've been working quite hard. Um, my management company, Line Up Sports, when uh, we're doing speaking gigs or um, working with commercial partners, uh, on purpose we CC'd, I'd say I'm CC'd with the men who were involved in the same panel or the same, you know, um, event or whatever it is, and then we're paid the same. So that's really interesting, uh, positive, um, the likes of Vodafone are the same, uh, you know, there's different types of uh, brands that make sure that if like, I'm involved in a thing with the men's, then it's, that's the same, so that's um, a positive for It is, yeah. Well, this is a, you know, obviously a very, very rich topic, and we could go on, we could speak probably all evening, we, we, we're pretty much out of time, I think, so can you please thank the, the panel, Margaret, um, Siobhan, Andrew, and Senna. I, I, I'm going to finish up now with, with, with two awards, one from Fiona Roche, uh, Roche from uh, Susquehanna, and then Vivian Tesler from Women in Business. Um, I'm not sure who's going to speak first. Well, actually, um, it's, it's going to be Vivian because... Oh, no, here's Fiona. <laughs> Here you are. For, yeah, that'd be perfect. Um, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Fiona. I'm here from Susquehanna, one of the sponsors. Um, and to start off, I'd just like to say, first of all, um, thank you and congratulations to the SMF for another wonderful event. Um, SIG has been sponsoring um, the Society for a number of years now, and I really do believe that it has been money well spent over the years. Um, year on year, this event continues to grow in stature, and um, it's one that I really look forward to attending every year. Um, so, so, yeah, congratulations to you guys. Um, I'd also like to thank, thank the panel for, back to somebody, um, for sharing your inspirational stories and um, you know, I for one love listening to successful men and women and speak about their journey, so, so thank you for, for being here tonight. Um, for those of you that don't know, SIG, um, just to give you a bit of background, we're a, a trading firm, we're based in the IFSC here in Dublin, um, we specialise in trading derivative products on the financial markets. Um, and, you know, I hate saying this, but the fact remains that the world of finance has in the past and continues to be, to a certain extent, um, a pretty male-dominated industry. Um, and however male-dominated finance is, the trading niche is, is even worse. Um, I've been a trader since 2005, um, and I can count on my fingers um, the number of female traders that I've worked with since then. Um, so in the world of trading, goals like 50-50 um, splits are, are kind of future ambitions for us. Um, right now for me as a recruiter and a manager, I'm still targeting female representation across all of our trading departments. Um, that said, I am very hopeful that change is afoot and I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, uh, at the moment we have more female traders in the pipelines through our graduate, grad programs and internship programs than we ever have had before. Um, and even better, among those women are um, some really exciting prospects for our, our stars for the future. Um, these are women who came with no experience trading before. Um, they didn't fit a trader stereotype, um, but that didn't, didn't and doesn't matter to them. Um, they're changing the stereotype for us and, and they are excelling in, in a male-dominated industry. Um, so, you know, each of you here today are, are agents of change. You know, you're, you come here interested and open-minded, um, looking to, to learn and to listen from the people here in front of you. Um, and the next step going forward is, is to go away inspired and hopefully change something yourself. Um, you know, is it, it, it might be to try a hobby that you think you might not be good at or submit a job application to a job that you, you know, dismiss that you won't get. Um, or just consider an industry like trading that you think you don't fit the stereotype for. Um, I think if you're open to changing the stereotype, um, then you might be surprised to find that your skills are, are skills that will make a future star as well. So, um, so it's great to be here with you guys and um, congratulations on the night and look forward to chatting to you, some of you afterwards. Hi guys, thank you so much everyone for coming this evening um, and tonight closes the end of our fourth annual Women in Business Conference. I have a few people I'd like to thank before we all head off. 
So firstly, guys, thank you so much for tonight and for your time and for sharing your stories. It has been incredible. So if you want to give another round of applause. <laughs> Secondly, without all of whom this would not be possible, Elizabeth, thank you so much, Head of Women in Business. You did an incredible job over the past few months and it has been, it has shown in the success of tonight. So well done to you. Finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors, so it's Sig, Davy, Irish Life and Elkstone. Um, and yeah, on that note, we have a drinks reception in the foyer and you're all more than welcome. So thank you very much, guys.